Okay, now let's think about externalities a little bit more formally with, uh, with some graphical examples. On the left, I'm going to have negative externality. On the right, I've got a positive externality. And I want to put them side by side so we can compare them to each other and see just how similar they are. Uh, the, you know, a, a positive externality is just the reverse of a negative externality. So you're going to see a symmetry in um, what shows up in these graphs. So let's begin with negative externalities over here. Uh, you've got a market, it's going to be in equilibrium. That's where supply and demand intersect each other, or at least we predict that it will make it to equilibrium. We get an equilibrium quantity, we get an equilibrium price. Okay. Now, under ordinary circumstances, that's exactly what we want to see the market do. Because in most markets, uh, markets without externalities, there is no additional spillover effect on other people. So we could just ignore this line. It, it doesn't exist uh, in a lot of markets. And if you don't have this external cost on other people, then all the available gains from trade is the area between the demand curve and the supply curve up to this point of equilibrium. And so we get all of the gains from trade uh, uh, realized or captured by the buyers and the sellers. Now here's the problem. In a, net, in a market where there's a negative externality, the buyers and sellers still maximize their own benefit by trading here at equilibrium. Because it's still true for them that up until that point, the buyer values the good more than what the seller what it costs the seller to produce and so they continue capturing surplus buyer and seller surplus up to this point okay however if there's a negative externality there's an external cost that's being imposed on bystanders which is given by the distance between these two curves whatever that cost is maybe it's five dollars a unit maybe it's ten dollars a unit maybe it's a thousand dollars a unit that is going to be an external cost. The buyer and the seller in this market or buyers and sellers in this market don't really think about that. They don't care about it because that cost isn't falling on them. All the costs in the, to the buyers and sellers are here on the supply curve, okay? So this is you know maybe a factory that's emitting some pollution and this external cost is uh, the cost of, uh, you know, aggravated asthma and, um, and environmental degradation on the, the people in the neighborhood of the factory, okay? So economists don't just care about maximizing the, the buyer surplus, the consumer surplus, and the um, producer surplus. We care about maximizing the surplus, the gains from trade to everybody, okay? Which means that an economist doesn't want to see the market stop here where the private benefit to the buyers is equal to the private cost of the sellers, we actually want to see the market stop here. Okay, so we would call this point the social optimum. The social optimum is the point where the value that buyers are capturing is equal to the cost to all of society, the sellers and Every, and all the bystanders and all the, the third parties as well, okay? So unfortunately, this equilibrium, this is where we expect the market to end up, but where we would like it to end up will be here at the social optimum. And I think that the um, in the, the videos that they posted on Marginal Revolution University, I think they refer to this as the efficient equilibrium. That's another term you could use for it. So at the social optimum or the efficient equilibrium, you're going to get this quantity, or you would have this quantity, which I'm going to call Q star. Anytime you see a star, that means the best or the optimal or where we want to end up. That's the quantity that the market should produce to get all of the, uh, you know, to maximize gains from trade. And a price that would be consistent with that would be here. At P star. All right. So this is where the market should end up or where ideally we'd like it to end up. This is where we think it is going to end up. And the difference between those two results in a deadweight loss. Okay. What is that deadweight loss? 
We'll notice all of these transactions to the left of the social optimum, the buyer is getting more value out of consuming these units than what it's costing society to produce them. And so we want to see all of these transactions happen. Then, however, as soon as you move to the right of Q star, the socially optimal quantity, now the value to consumers is less than what it's costing society to produce those goods. And so now the cost of production when you, when, or sorry, the cost of society, when you take the cost of production on the supply curve and add in the external cost uh, to third parties, that's now greater than the value of consumption to the buyer. All right. Now, unfortunately for us, there's still surplus that's being generated between the buyer and the seller. They are being made better off through these transactions. But if you add in the social cost to everyone, there's a loss. There's a net loss on these trades given by this red rectangle right here. And that is our old friend or our old foe, uh, the deadweight loss. This deadweight loss represents the excess cost of producing those units between Q star and QE, the socially optimal quantity and the equilibrium quantity, okay? So if there is a negative externality, we expect the market to produce too much of this good. There's overproduction. QE is greater than Q star, and we don't wanna see that. Now, the situation is gonna be very similar for a positive externality. The equilibrium is gonna be right here at QE units. and PE units. And that will be the, let's put it over here. The equilibrium is at that point there. However, in a market with positive externalities, we actually don't want the market to stop producing at this point because even beyond this equilibrium, there's still these additional units where the value to society as a whole is greater than what it is costing uh, the seller to produce. Now, unfortunately, the buyer and the seller have run out of profitable trades when they get to this point, QE. And so we don't expect them to be willing to continue trading because the seller's cost is greater than the buyer's benefit and so between the two of them, at least one of them is gonna lose money on that transaction. Maybe both of them will. However, economists aren't interested in just the buyer and the seller. We're interested in the buyer, the seller, and everyone else. And they are conferring this external benefit, which is the distance between the demand curve and this green curve here. And uh, because they're conferring that external benefit, we would like them to keep on producing and trading until they hit this point, which we call the social optimum. That would be consistent with a larger quantity of units. And also a higher price. However, because in this market there's no, uh, no incentive, financial incentive for the buyer and seller to keep trading beyond the equilibrium, there's gonna be these trades that would have been profitable to society as a whole that just aren't going to happen. And so we get a symmetrical deadweight loss. It's gonna be all the area between this green social value curve and the, um, and the supply curve, between the equilibrium quantity unit of units and the socially optimal quantity of units. So once again, we have a deadweight loss. Uh, let me also uh, back up and, and define terms here. I'm not sure that I did it at the beginning of this video. So this supply curve here, that maps out the costs to the sellers of producing. This curve up here that I've labeled SC, that stands for social cost. The social cost curve captures all the costs of the sellers plus the external cost to uh, bystanders. 
when you have a positive externality, you take the external benefit and you, uh, you put it up above the demand curve. So the demand curve tells us the private value that buyers have for consuming each unit. The social value function, which here I've labeled SV, that social value function is equal to the private benefits of consumption plus the positive spillover benefits, those external benefits to bystanders. And it is the social cost and the social value that we care about, not the private cost and the private value that we care about. All right. So notice the, the similarity between these two. Uh, both of them have an equilibrium where we expect the market to end up. Both of them have a social optimal quantity, which is different from the equilibrium. In the case of a negative externality, the social optimum is less than equilibrium. In the case of a positive externality, the social optimum is greater than the equilibrium quantity. They also then both result in deadweight losses, but you'll see they're symmetrical. The, the triangles here, they, it points to the right for a positive externality, it points to the left for a negative externality. For a negative externality, it is the, the excess cost that you're imposing on people in excess of the, the value of consumption right, on these units between Q star and QE. So this is a real cost that is being imposed on, on people. Over here with a positive externality, this deadweight loss is not a cost that's being imposed, it's value that could be captured by society if you could get these extra units produced, but we're not going to see them produced unless we do something uh, about it because the market equilibrium is right here. This is not what you might call a real cost uh, or a, a financial cost. This is an opportunity cost. This is value that could be captured, but we don't see it captured because it's not consistent with the equilibrium if we leave the market to its own devices. All right, I'm gonna leave it there for, uh, for this video. In the next video, I'm going to talk about how you can fix uh, positive and negative externalities, or rather you can fix markets that have those externalities through uh, a simple tax mechanism.